the northern capital, a city that for a long time remained hidden from the outside world. A place where the ruins of ancient dynasties intermingle with futuristic skyscrapers. It is the heart of the most populous nation in the world. Over 21 million people call it their home. It is here that China's political power, cultural heritage and economic might come together. But there is something else in Beijing hidden beneath the noisy streets and ancient avenues. A maze that holds the secrets of millions. A world where modern subway lines intertwine with endlessly long old bunkers, where entire communities live unnoticed. Today we'll dive into its underground layers and uncover. What lies beneath Beijing? Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel to see even more exciting content. Let's start from the very surface. So, the surface course of Beijing's roadways is made of fine-grained asphalt or bitumen. This layer is typically between 25 to 50 millimeters, one to two inches thick. Below that is the binder course, with a thickness of 50 to 100 millimeters, two to four inches, also made of bitumen or asphalt of a different grade. Next comes the base course. This layer is made of crushed stone, gravel, or a sand gravel mixture. It distributes the load and maintains the structural integrity of the road surface. The recommended minimum thickness for the base course is 100 millimeters, four inches. At this point, we are 30 centimeters, 12 inches deep. And here is where things start to get more interesting. From 0.8 to 1.2 meters, 2.5 to 4 feet. This is where most of the city's gas pipelines are laid. This depth complies with the standards of low pressure underground gas pipelines used to supply residential buildings. At about the same depth, you'll also find cable ducts and power lines. This is Beijing's nervous system, which provides energy and communication to both residential homes and business centers. Fiber optic cables ensure an internet connectivity across the city also run here. From 1.2 to 2 meters, 4 to 6.5 feet, at this depth you'll find the city's main water supply pipes. Although Beijing has a subtropical climate, winters can be quite cold, so the pipes are laid deep enough to prevent freezing and bursting. From 2 meters, 6 feet and deeper, you'll start to see the so-called multi-utility tunnels, MUT. Modern districts in Beijing are actively implementing this concept. These tunnels contain several types of utilities at once. Water supply, heating, electrical networks, and even telecommunications. They lie at a depth of 2 to 5 meters, 6 to 16 feet, and help centralize the management of utility systems. Moreover, they simplify maintenance, which is crucial in a densely populated and built-up city like Beijing. But that's far from everything you can see at a depth of two meters, six and a half feet in Beijing. In addition to modern utilities, these depths hide some artifacts that offer a lot of insights into the history of the city and all of China. In 2021, more than 100 cultural relics were discovered in five tombs at the Liu Lia site, located on the outskirts of the city. This is where the history of Beijing once began. Just imagine, these relics are over 3,000 years old. So what exactly did the researchers find? First, an unusual architectural structure made of rammed earth, which is uncommon for this region. Other construction methods were usually used in ancient China. Thus, discovering rammed earth architecture in this region is something really special. It is worth noting that the structure was quite massive. It was 28 meters, 92 feet long, with a foundation of 1.62 meters, 5 feet deep. At the same site, more than 20,000 ceramic fragments were found, as well as carbonized seeds of millet, wheat, and soybeans. A bronze sword, arrowheads, and jade and stone relics were also discovered among the artifacts. All of these suggest that a developed agrarian society once thrived in this region. 
The new findings in Luilie will further portray a panorama of Yan Vassal State, which was a historical foundation of the Beijing Tianjin Hebei coordinated development today. Shan Xixiang, head of the Chinese Society in Cultural Relics, said, It will also demonstrate how diverse cultures mixed with each other and formed a united Chinese civilization. All these discoveries point to the rich ancient history of Beijing, but its more recent history is just as fascinating. If we go just several meters deeper, we'll discover something truly incredible. Beneath Beijing, at a depth of 8 to 18 meters, 26 to 59 feet, lies a real underground city, surprisingly named Beijing Underground City. This massive network of bunkers, tunnels, and other facilities was built in the late 1960s to early 1970s by order of Mao Zedong. The purpose of the project was to create a shelter for all city residents in the event of a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. At that time, relations between the two countries had sharply deteriorated, and the threat of nuclear conflict was very real. The project was even popularly nicknamed the Underground Great Wall. And yes, when we say the shelter was meant to save all city residents, that's no exaggeration. The Chinese government declared that once completed, the complex would be able to shelter the entire population of Beijing at the time. All six million people. With such, for lack of a better word, ambitious goals, it's hard to imagine the scale that this structure would need to be. And its size doesn't fail to impress, to say the least. The total area of the underground city is 85 square kilometers, 33 square miles. To put things in perspective, that's about half the size of Washington DC, the capital of the United States. But the size is only part of the story. It's not enough just to fit 6 million people somewhere they still need to eat, sleep, and maintain hygiene. And here's where things get really interesting, because the underground city is by no means a metaphor. The complex was equipped with everything necessary for normal life. Well, as normal as it can be called in the face of a nuclear apocalypse. Living spaces, hospitals, and medical units, communication hubs for staying in touch with the outside world, and storage spaces for food, water, and equipment. And that's not all. Schools and preschools, restaurants, theatres, factories. There was even a mushroom farm. And the cherry on top, a roller skating rink. But wait, there is more. Additionally, the system included around 70 well drilling sites that could provide water in case of emergency. The complex's ventilation system had 2,300 shafts that could be sealed airtight to protect against poisonous gases. There were also special gas and waterproof hatches, as well as massive concrete gates, designed to shield against biochemical attacks, gas attacks, and nuclear fallout. The exact length of the underground city has never been officially disclosed. However, it is believed that the tunnels connect various landmarks. Rumor has it that they link Zongmanghai, the Great Hall of the People, and even military bases on the outskirts of the city. According to the China Internet Information Center, the tunnels cover all the central districts of Beijing, from Zhuanwuman and Zaiden to Chuenmen and Chongwen district, and extend towards the Western Hills. It's even rumored that almost every house in Beijing used to have a hidden hatch leading to these tunnels. In the event of a nuclear strike, the plan was to relocate half of Beijing's population underground, while the other half would be sent to Xishan, the Western Hills. It was believed that the mountainous terrain would protect against the shockwave and, to some extent, block the spread of radioactive clouds. And here we see the first discrepancy in the government's claim that the underground city was supposed to fit all 6 million residents of Beijing. Independent estimates are even more conservative. It is believed that although the underground city managed to grow to the described scale, it could realistically shelter only a few hundred thousand people. Nevertheless, even this minimal estimate is impressive. At the very least, the shelter could certainly have accommodated those who built it. More than 300,000 local residents, including school children who worked as volunteers, were involved in the construction. In some cases, tunnels were dug by hand, without the use of heavy machinery. 
Centuries old city walls, towers and gates, including the old city gates of Sisemen and Fengshemen, and Chongwemen were demolished to provide building materials for the complex. So what happened to this shelter in the end? Well, in the end, there was no war between China and the USSR. After the construction was completed, locals began to use many sections of the underground city in different ways. The tunnels remained cool in the summer and warm in the winter, so some of them were converted into budget hotels, shopping centers, and even theaters. The underground spaces were particularly active in the 1980s and 1990s when Beijing faced overpopulation and a severe shortage of affordable housing. Many parts of the tunnels were transformed into shopping centers and markets. As Beijing rapidly grew, underground space became a valuable resource. Small private shops began to appear in the tunnels where ordinary citizens eagerly shopped for everyday goods at affordable prices. Initially, these underground markets mainly attracted locals, but eventually became popular among tourists as well. The underground served as a vibrant culture hub. In some parts of the underground city, theaters and concert halls were opened, hosting events for every taste. One of the most interesting projects was transforming part of the complex into a gallery for local artists, where one could see the works of both young and mature masters. Moreover, parts of the tunnels were repurposed for sports events. Some spaces were turned into gyms of different calibers, equipped with all kinds of gear, where local residents could play table tennis, practice yoga, or engage in other physical activity, away from the hustle and the heat of the above ground, Beijing. Of course, such practical repurposing didn't reach all parts of the underground city. After all, it was simply too vast. A significant portion inevitably fell into disrepair. Nonetheless, the complex was never entirely abandoned. The tunnels were regularly checked for water leaks and kept in proper sanitary condition to prevent pest infestations and structural damage. In the 1980s, China opened up to the world. By 2000, they even started allowing tourists into the underground city, albeit with some restrictions. But without an imminent military threat, the maintenance of this massive underground complex became less of a priority. Originally, around 90 entrances were built, all concealed within shops along Tianmen's main streets. Many of these have since been destroyed or closed off for renovation. Yes, the complex has been officially under construction since 2008, and it remains so to this day. Nevertheless, certain parts are still used for commercial purposes. In some branches of the underground city, you can find rather conceptual establishments like cocktail bars, where the owners preserve and even emphasize the dungeon-like ambience. According to visitors, even the air here is extremely authentic, heavy and damp. One popular bar, Memory, serves not only as an entertainment venue, but also as a kind of museum and interactive historical installation. The vaulted brick ceilings, a massive concrete blast-proof door, and a long hallway transformed into a kind of shooting range with toy guns and balloons to pop. A subtle nod to the site's military pasts are all preserved here. Another place that serves as a reminder of the underground city's direct purpose is a museum near the Dashila sub-district. Tourists once used this museum as one of the entrances to the city, although now closed to the public, it sparks visitors' curiosity with a glass door embedded in the floor. In other parts of the underground city, you can also find more extravagant and even somewhat glamorous spots. For example, there is a wine cellar where the owners regularly hold various events and tastings. But such well-maintained places are now few and far between. Unfortunately, most of the underground city that is still accessible to people has a rather unpleasant reputation. At night, many people, mostly migrant workers and students from rural areas, head to underground spaces known as atomic rooms. Just as the ominous name suggests, conditions in these atomic rooms are often dismal. They're cramped, damp and poorly ventilated. Many living blocks consist of narrow rooms without even a window, making underground living even harsher. But first, let's explain what we mean by cramped conditions here. Local laws require a minimum living area of four square meters, 43 square feet per tenant. Think about it, that's just the legal minimum. 
And yet many unscrupulous landlords ignore even this standard. Few manage to take pictures or videos of how these places actually look. Authorities prohibit foreigners from accessing this unsightly part of Beijing. However, Antonio Fasilongo, an Italian documentary photographer known for his long-term social and humanitarian projects, managed to do so. His poignant photo report and documentary, The Chinese Dream, reveal some of the secrets of these places, though not all. One of Fasilongo's photographs shows a four-year-old, Jing Jing, who lives in such a tiny room with her grandmother, father, and younger brother that it barely fits a bed. Here, the stark contrast is heartbreaking. Their home is next to a large area used as a motorcycle parking lot. It's one of the poorest places I've ever been to, says Fasilongo. As early as 2010, in response to issues with landlord negligence and safety threats, Beijing banned the use of nuclear shelters and other underground city spaces as housing. But this decision largely remained on paper as most bunker residents have nowhere else to go. According to National Geographic, about a million people live in Beijing's underground city. The atomic rooms have become a symbol of the stark contrast between the ambitious original vision of the underground city and its present reality. The complex was intended as a refuge for all Beijing residents in the event of a nuclear attack. However, today it's become a home for people facing no threat of a nuclear bomb. Nevertheless, not all rooms are equally bad. More comfortable conditions have been created in some parts of the underground hotels. They have access to water and electricity, allowing residents to at least minimally improve their living conditions. Moreover, many of the residents are ambitious young people who see underground housing as just a temporary phase until they save enough money for something better. Indeed, photos often show young people with laptops and not so gloomy expressions. Another recent phenomenon involves organizations transforming abandoned shelters into community centers. Some underground spaces have been repurposed into cafeterias, billiard rooms, karaoke spots, calligraphy schools, and even dance schools. Indeed, this underground city is certainly impressive in its scale. Although disheartening in its darker aspects, it definitely leaves no one indifferent. But it's time for us to go further and deeper. What about a true imperial palace? One that lies nearly twice as deep as the atomic underground city. Yep, such an amazing place really exists under Beijing at a depth of around 27 meters, 88 feet. And it was intended for the Chinese emperor Wan Li, though only after his death. This is the awe-inspiring grand underground tomb of the 13th Ming Dynasty ruler and his two empresses. Built between 1584 and 1590, this complex remains the only one of the 13 imperial tombs to have been excavated and opened to the public. Its scale is truly imperial, especially for a burial site. The underground palace covers an area of 1,195 square meters. That's 12,862 square feet. And that's just the underground part. Above ground, it encompasses an entire city-like area of 180,000 square meters, 1,937,504 square feet. The complex consists of five interconnected halls, the front, central, and rear halls, as well as two side chambers located to the left and the right. The largest of these chambers is the rear hall, which originally housed three marble thrones and three coffins belonging to the emperor and his wives. Now, only replicas stand in their place. Why not the originals? As a sad story we'll cover in a moment. All halls are connected by narrow passages, and the floors are laid with the so-called golden bricks, coated with a special glaze, symbolizing imperial authority. The dungeon walls are made of massive stone slabs and blocks, and were once hermetically sealed with a so-called diamond wall a special structure designed to protect the tomb's content from external factors. During excavations from 1956 to 1958, over 3,000 cultural relics were discovered in the tomb, including rare artifacts such as golden crowns, jade ornaments, and painted ceramics. 
However, many items were damaged due to the lack of advanced preservation technology at the time. Sadly, even the remains of the Emperor and Empress were destroyed during the cultural renovation, when the tomb was looted and the mummified bodies were taken outside and desecrated. The tomb reflects traditional Chinese beliefs about the afterlife and the remarkable craftsmanship of Ming Dynasty architects with disconcerting vividness. The central part of the complex, known as the City of Treasures, has a circular shape symbolizing the heavens while the square front part of the complex represents the earth. This symbolism aligns with the ancient Chinese concept of a round heaven and a square earth, and underscores the importance of imperial power as the link between heaven and earth. Today, the Dingling Tomb serves as a major archaeological and tourist site, preserving unique artifacts from Ming-era burial culture. Most of the relics salvaged during excavations are housed in the tomb's museum, which has become a center for cultural heritage preservation. The underground palace of the Dingling Tomb is not just a burial site, but an architectural masterpiece embodying the power and grandeur of the Ming Dynasty, despite all the trials its treasures and relics went through in the 20th century. It is worth noting that Dingling is the only excavated tomb out of the 13 known. Most Ming Dynasty tombs are located here in a cluster around the outskirts of Beijing. They are collectively known as the 13 tombs of the Ming Dynasty. Indeed, underground Beijing and its surroundings conceal many more mysteries, and the country's authorities are in no hurry to unveil them. Moreover, this is not a matter of the proverbial Chinese secrecy, but a very sensible desire not to repeat past mistakes. During the excavations in the middle of the last century, thousands of items made from silk, textiles, wood and porcelain, as well as many jewels, were found in the tomb. But most importantly, scientists discovered the remains of Emperor Wan Li and his two empresses. Unfortunately, the technology and resources needed to adequately preserve the unearthed artifacts were simply not available at the time. A series of preservation attempts have gone terribly wrong and many silk and textile artifacts ended up in a drafty warehouse. To make the matters worse, the warehouse was damp, with actual water leaks seeping through. As a result, most of these items were damaged and now only replicas are displayed in the modern museum. The greatest loss occurred during the infamous Cultural Revolution. The so-called Red Guards broke into the Dingling Tomb and dragged out the remains of Emperor Wan Li and his empresses to the front of the tomb, where they were posthumously and publicly condemned, burned and then discarded. Even their coffins were destroyed along with many other relics. The lessons from the Dingling Tomb excavations led to a new policy in the People's Republic of China, prohibiting the excavation of historical sites except for rescue purposes. To date, no proposal to open any other imperial tombs has been approved. Well, having learned about this sad cautionary tale, it's time for us to continue our journey through underground Beijing. And what will happen if we go even deeper? Will we delve further into ancient history? Actually, it's quite the opposite. We've now reached the epitome of modernity in every sense of the word. At a depth of up to 42 meters lies the Beijing subway system. Not just a transportation network, but a real underground metropolis serving millions of people every day. With 27 lines and 490 stations, it covers more than 836 kilometers, 519 miles, crossing 12 urban and suburban districts, as well as one district in the neighborhood, Hebei province. As of December 2023, the Beijing subway has been recognized as the longest in the world, surpassing even the Shanghai Metro. Construction on the first line began in 1965. The Beijing Metro officially opened on October 1, 1969. This makes it the oldest metro system in mainland China and indeed in all of East Asia. But the current scale with 27 lines is one of many examples of the so-called Chinese miracle. For over 30 years, until 2002, the Beijing Metro consisted of just two lines. Only in the last two decades has there been an explosive acceleration in development. 
Today, the Beijing subway transports an average of around 10.5 million passengers on weekdays, with peak periods reaching up to 13.75 million passengers per day, a record set on July 12, 2019. So let's take a closer look at the structure of this extensive network. Most subway tunnels lie at depths of between up to 30 meters, 98 feet, though some sections go even deeper. For example, Dongxia Station on Line 6 goes down to about 34 meters, 112 feet, currently making it the deepest in the system. But that is not the record. The deepest part of the system is a section of Line 8 between the Chuenmen and Wangfujing stations. It reaches a depth of 42 meters, that's 138 feet. This is the completely new part of Line 8, which was put into operation in 2021. It was constructed using a massive tunneling shield. But even this isn't the record. The true record was short-lived, and now only a few people know that the Beijing subway was initially planned to be much deeper. The original design proposed subway tunnels that could also serve paramilitary purposes. For example, Line 1 was conceived as an additional defense mechanism, a means to evacuate city residents to western Beijing in the event of a potential nuclear war. Sound familiar? Indeed it does. Surprisingly, Beijing's underground city, which we've already explored, was built in tandem with the first metro line. Now, what about the depth? Shafts up to 120 meters, that's 390 feet deep, were dug between the future Gongshufen and Mushidin stations, where those initial tunnels were intended to run. However, in May 1960, the high pressure from groundwater, which caused many issues, forced the authorities to abandon the deep tunnel plan in favor of shallower alternatives. The first lines were then constructed at a depth of about 20 meters, 66 feet, using conventional open-cut methods. Despite its already impressive scale, the Beijing subway still struggles to keep up with transportation demand. Key lines like Line 1 and Line 10 are often overcrowded during peak hours. By 2025, the authorities plan to expand the network's total length to nearly 1,000 kilometers, that's 620 miles roughly, and increase the number of stations to handle the expected passenger flow of 18.5 million trips per day. But all these issues concern the fast-paced world of the living. Meanwhile, Beijing subway has developed eerie urban legends involving those with nowhere to hurry. Namely, the dead. One of the most famous legends is about Line 1, which runs right over the Babua Shan Cemetery. Rumor has it that its work has encountered numerous unexplained accidents and equipment failures during the construction of this line in the 1960s. Local monks even held ceremonies to appease the restless souls of the disturbed graves, promising the spirits that the subway could close by 11 p.m., as the hours between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. are considered the time of the dead. However, there's a twist. Most, if not all, subway lines in Beijing now close after 11 p.m., with the last train on Line 1 typically arriving at Pinguan Station at 12.11 a.m. It seems like the spirits no longer mind the timing. Spirits or no spirits, things have never been easy with Line 1. Built with potential military use in mind, rumors persist that it contains phantom stations, inaccessible to ordinary passengers. And indeed, Line 1 has at least two restricted access stations, Gaojing and Fushouling. Both stations were originally intended to serve as military bases. However, Fushouling, the penultimate station on the line, was eventually opened to the public as it was located outside the base. Currently under reconstruction, Fushouling is expected to reopen in 2025, finally allowing access to the station that had been previously off limits. As for Gaojing Station, it remains closed and inaccessible. Indeed, after such unexpected twists with mystical and military secrets, it's even a bit frightening to imagine what might await us if we were to go down even deeper under Beijing. And there we would find an even larger, more intricate and vitally important network of large and small tunnels. This is Beijing's sewer system, which reaches depths of up to 50 meters, that's 165 feet, in its deepest sections. 
Beijing's sewer system began to develop rapidly at the end of the 20th century as the city grew and modernized. The population growth rate was nothing short of explosive. In 1950, the city's wastewater discharge was 65,000 cubic meters. That's over 17 million gallons per day. By 1980, this figure had skyrocketed to 2 million cubic meters, over half a billion gallons per day. Half of this came from household water, while the other half from industrial waste. At the time, most of the urban population lived in apartment complexes connected to the sewer system. Almost all wastewater was discharged into nearby rivers and lakes without treatment. Around 1,200 factories also released waste directly into the rivers. This posed the risk of environmental, if not humanitarian, disaster. Beijing had to turn to its sister city, Tokyo, for help, urgently needing technological solutions and skilled experts. The system was constructed in multiple phases over decades. Today, Beijing has at least 15 large centralized treatment plants. The largest of these, the Gaopeidian Wastewater Treatment Plant, is among the biggest in the world, capable of treating up to 1 million cubic meters, over 250 million gallons, of wastewater per day, serving nearly 2.5 million people. Most sewer pipes and collectors are laid at depths of up to 30 meters, that's 100 feet. However, in the busiest and most densely populated parts of the city, pipes go down as deep as 50 meters, 165 feet. This is done to minimize the risk of collapses and leaks and to protect the pipes from pressure and vibrations caused by the subway and surface traffic. The system is designed with Beijing's challenging climate in mind. Rapid temperature fluctuations and seasonal rainstorms are common. To prevent flooding, the sewer system is equipped with special reservoirs that can temporarily hold excess water. In case of heavy rainfall, these underground tanks over 40 meters 130 feet deep can store several million cubic gallons of water, which is then gradually pumped to treatment facilities. Despite the system's high efficiency, new challenges have emerged. Recently, Beijing's groundwater reserves have decreased by 90% compared to the 1950s, creating a risk of soil subsidence and potential damage to underground pipes. Well, from now on, we'll proceed cautiously on our journey. Wait a minute, is there something even deeper beneath Beijing than its deepest sewer collectors? Indeed there is, and here we won't find any foul-smelling urban waste, but a fast-moving flow of vehicles. We're talking about the latest underground tunnel for high-speed traffic drilled only recently in the summer of 2023 at an impressive depth of 75 meters, 246 feet. This is one of Beijing's most advanced and deepest underground transportation projects constructed beneath the eastern part of the Sixth Ring Road. For reference, the Beijing Sixth Ring Road is the city's outmost ring highway, located approximately 15 to 20 kilometers, that's 9 to 12 miles, from the city center. And now, beneath its eastern sections, lies its high-tech antipode, a 7.4 kilometer, 4.6 mile tunnel. But this isn't just any tunnel, it's a three-tiered structure. The top level is used for exhaust fumes and general ventilation. The middle level is a two-way, six-lane expressway. And the bottom level serves as an evacuation and rescue corridor in case of accidents or other emergencies. This project is a true engineering feat. One of the world's largest tunneling machines, TBM Jinghua, was used in its construction. The machine's shield measures 16 meters, about 52 feet in diameter, and 145 meters, 475 feet in length. Weighing 4,500 tons, it was specially designed to navigate complex geological formations. The tunnel on the Sixth Ring Road doesn't just alleviate traffic issues, it also frees up significant surface space for parks, green areas, and other urban facilities, which is especially important for improving the quality of life in the area. The new highway is expected to redistribute traffic flow and enhance Beijing's connectivity with neighboring regions Dianjin and Hebei province. Well, surely this must be the deepest structure beneath Beijing, with nothing underneath it. Not quite. There's something even deeper. In fact, much deeper. So much deeper that no one knows its exact depth or scale. But it is certainly real. 
This is the Joint Operations Command Center, JOCC, of the People's Liberation Army, PLA, of China. This complex is considered one of China's most classified and secure military facilities, and its exact location and depth remain a military secret. However, some information is still available, and we're here to share it. The purpose of the JOCC is clear. It is the central headquarters for managing all of China's military operations. Established in 2016 as part of a major military reform by Xi Jinping, it serves as the PLA's primary hub, directing Chinese forces both domestically and internationally. The JOCC is the top command center from which the president and their top military team oversee Chinese armed forces combat operations. What is known about its structure and location? According to some reports, the center lies deep underground in karst caves within the Western Hills National Forest Park, approximately 20 kilometers, that's 12 miles, from the city center. What makes these caves unique is that they lie beneath a granite and limestone layer over 1,000 meters, 3,300 feet thick. The caves extend kilometers deep, so one can only imagine the depth at which the center is located. This depth and protection make the complex highly resilient to nuclear strikes and any other extreme impacts imaginable. It is said that the underground cave network is large enough to accommodate an entire city. The center is equipped with the latest military technology, at least there's no reason to doubt this. In 2017, state broadcaster CCTV aired footage showing part of the interior, including a two-story main hall with a massive video screen spanning dozens of feet wide. The room also featured a podium, a wall covered with world maps, and a designated rest area for the Supreme Commander, that is, the President of China. On either side of the Commander's seat were two rows of seats for other members of the Central Military Commission and high-ranking PLA officers, with various command workstations behind them. This is where all PLA actions, including operations by the Navy, Air Force and Strategic Missile Forces, would be coordinated in the event of a military conflict. The center's technological setup includes powerful communication systems, allowing instant contact with military bases and even Chinese forces stationed abroad. Beneath its depth and physical security, the complex is equipped with life support systems that allow it to operate autonomously for extended periods. In the event of a nuclear threat or other disaster, the entire command team can function from this center without needing to surface. The center also has air and water filtration systems enabling occupants to remain inside without external supplies for several months. Currently, the JOCC symbolizes China's ambitions in defense and security, demonstrating how far the country has advanced in military technology and commanding in the 21st century.